Well, um, normally on these occasions, um, and obviously it may be absent tonight as well, although I didn't think it was going to be, I feel as I sort of break up the party to uh, welcome everybody, a bit of a party pooper. But on this occasion, of course, it's the, uh, the mark that we come to in the evening that you've all been waiting for, uh, when we will hear from Sir David and, uh, and our other speakers. Um, we are very pleased, Charles Russell, to have been given the opportunity to host this evening on behalf of the World Bound Trust and in its support. Uh, we're very grateful uh, that you've all come, um, and you're very welcome. Uh, the concerns which have led to the creation of the World Land Trust in 1989 have now become um, of universal concerns. And we at Charles Russell have to take them very seriously, and our clients um, have to take them very seriously, whether they are individuals or whether they're organisations. But there are also um, business opportunities, as there always are in these circumstances. And uh, the growth of Charles Russell's clean tech services uh, is proof of that. We have, as many of you will know, a very strong private client team. So for those very rich philanthropic clients, we can point them in the right direction. And of course, we have one of London's largest legal teams advising charities. So I'm confident that in the coming years, as these things become consciously more important, Charles Russell and its clients will be considered to be responsible world citizens. Now, we're all very fortunate that Sir David has kindly agreed to talk to us this evening about the World Land Trust and the work it does in the fight to protect biodiversity in what is a very changing modern world. And we'll also hear uh, from our other speakers, and perhaps even from David himself, about what business can do to help um, in this fight. We have Malcolm Preston of PricewaterhouseCoopers. We have Simon Barnes, the celebrated journalist. And we have Rohini Finch of the World Land Trust itself. It's tempting to think that the problem is so huge and tsunami-like that there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. And that anything we try and do to place in the path of this progress will be in vain. But I'm sure we'll be told by our speakers this evening that in that line of thinking is despair, and that all human endeavor starts small somewhere, and that with will it gathers strength so that even it can turn the tide of what is happening in the world today. Now there's no time like the present to make a start. And amongst you, um, soon, will be several people with pledge forms. And in each corner of the room, uh, there is a chart showing what your money, how far your money can go. Um, actually, it's quite remarkable what £100 will buy um, in rainforest terms. Um, and there are other bargains there, for those of you um, inclined. <laughs> so please, um, as you are energised by... Um, listening to our speakers, please get scribbling away. As an incentive, Sir David assigned 10 copies of the um, Frozen Planet book, um, and the top 10 uh, pledges, in terms of, of size, um, <laughs> will receive a copy of that book. Sir David will hand them out at um, 8.15. To qualify, you have to get your pledge in by 8.10. <laughs> anyway, um, wasting no more time, um, please join me in welcoming Sir David. We've all, for many, many years, um, been thrilled um, and raptured in our living rooms um, by what he has done for us. It's given us so much pleasure. And speaking for myself, the idea of a live event is uh, too exciting for words. So, Sir David, thank you very much for coming. I, um, I first became involved in this conservation business a rather long time ago. Uh, getting on for 60 years ago. Um, and uh, 60 years ago, it was a minority of one of just a few far-sighted people who saw what was coming. Uh, and the canaries in the coal mines, as it were, 
were some species which were about to disappear for good. And the conservation effort focused on these. The Arabian oryx, the giant panda, those sort of remarkable, rare, endangered animals. Uh, and we focused on them. And it was comparatively easy, really, because it was a good way of focusing public attention, very charismatic creatures, and who would wish them to disappear forever. But slowly, we began to realize that this might be a good selling mechanism, but it actually misrepresented the situation. Just saving a single species, of course, is important. But it's only important because it's an indication of something. A giant panda, or a Javan rhinoceros, or a mountain gorilla that only lives in a concrete pit in a zoo is not really a mountain gorilla or a giant panda anymore. It's a terrible, terrible prisoner with doom look staring it in the face. It's not just about single species. Well, we continued along those lines for quite some time. And then we realized slowly, perhaps too slowly, that what we're talking about is not a mountain gorilla. We're talking about the whole ecosystem, the complex community of plants and animals, all of which interlock and damage one, and you can never tell how far the damage will spread or where it will go. But what we're talking about was saving ecosystems. Fine. So what you need if you're going to conserve the wildlife of the world is land. And that penny took a remarkably long time to drop. But drop it did. So then the emphasis changed. And we realized that it was ecosystems. It was land. Sometimes land of no consequence. Mangrove swamps, bogs, high mountain peaks. Sometimes land of a lot of consequence. Meadows, <coughs> coastal plains. But it was land. So the emphasis changed. So if we want to save these things, we're going to save land. And a lot of the wealthier world countries in the world set about the business of buying that land to set up. And that started another problem. Neo-imperialism. Who are these wealthy people around the world who think that they can go across the remoter parts of the undeveloped world and buy the land and tell the local people that they aren't allowed to stay on there, that it, that it belongs to uh, some rare antelope. Who are these neo-imperialists? That caused a big problem. Because when you're dealing with undeveloped countries and people living at a very, very low level of, of, of material existence, having wealthy people coming along and telling them what to do is not welcome. And it is, after all, their land. So now we move to the third phase. And the third phase is represented, I'm proud to say, by the World Land Trust. Because the World Land Trust knows that if that land in that remote part of the world is to be saved, the people who can save it are the people who live there. People who live there who understand the treasure which is in their possession. And that is what is so important about the World Land Trust. The World Land Trust is not a large organization with a great number of people sitting in offices in, in London or in anywhere else. The World Land Trust has a minimal number of people who, when they see a problem, identify the people living there who know what the problem is the people who have the enterprise and the conviction
to do something about it. And it empowers them. It empowers them with money. The money given to the World Land Trust, in my estimation, has more effect on the wild world than almost anything I can think of. Is the problem important? It's crucially important. Because since I started, as I said, 50 years ago, there has been one enormous change. In the last 50 years, when I remember starting becoming involved in conservation, the population of the world has tripled. Not just doubled, but tripled. And it's nothing we can do will stop that increase. We could, might slow it, but stop it in our lifetimes, we can't. So land becomes even more important. Do we have a right to say, well, in that case, forget the natural world. What about babies? What about children? I put it to you that without the natural world, mankind is doomed. We are dependent upon the natural world for the very air we breathe, <coughs> every particle of food that we eat, and many, including would seem, including me, would say we depend upon it for our very sanity. We are part of the natural world, we have a responsibility for the natural world, and even with the gross increase in population which we contemplate now, we can accommodate that by looking after the natural world and making sure that humanity simply doesn't spread willy-nilly and without care of the consequences over every particle, every square yard of the globe. So World, Life, World Land Trust, in my estimation, is leading the way. In my estimation, the support given to the World Land Trust is support that goes as directly to the place where it's needed, to the people, not here, not in any other capital city of the Western world, but to the people who live on that land, who will care for the land in the way that only they can and that only they understand. So I count it a privilege to have uh, met John and Viv Burton, who are the World Land Trust, who started it, who still head it, and who still make sure that the money it raises goes to the sort of people, the sort of organization, and the sort of land which I've described. So if you do care for the natural world and want to support the natural world, I would like to suggest that there is no better way of doing so than helping the World Land Trust. Patrick said, my name is Malcolm Preston, and I have the unenviable task of following Sir David. <laughs> um, and even better, I've been asked to talk about the business of biodiversity, so get ready. Um, I'm a partner in PwC, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, I lead our UK and our global sustainability practice, um, which is some 100 people in the UK, 700 people worldwide, focused just on the sustainability issue. Tonight I'm not going to talk about all that, I'm going to talk about biodiversity. <clears throat> I should say at the start that we've been associated with the World Land Trust for many, many years. When PwC first got involved in this whole area, um, much like Sir David was saying, we assessed which charitable organisation we wanted to work with to do our carbon offsetting. We set ourselves out to be the first professional services firm to be carbon neutral, which meant we had to offset, and we chose World Land Trust. So we have been using them for many years to do our own, work, uh, our own offsetting and buying pieces of forest through them uh, in places like Ecuador. And Paraguay. We also work with some of World Land Trust's own clients, and this will start to give you a flavour of what I mean by the business of biodiversity. Um, one of their bigger clients is Swire Group, and Swire Shipping in particular. 
who have given them an awful lot of money um, for, for purchasing land, the Paraguayan Atlantic rainforest, in fact, which is one of the most um, denuded of the rainforests. There's only about 1% left. Um, the work we're doing is helping them get an accreditation scheme going so that through the avoided deforestation by protecting that land, they can achieve carbon credits. That is carbon credits that aren't yet even tradable on a, on a tradable market because we haven't yet got a tradable market for uh, commercial carbon credits. Why would Swire be interested in acquiring land for carbon credits when they can't trade them? Because the shipping industry will be regulated. They are the, one of the worst polluters. Did you know that if you take not just the, the GHGs, the greenhouse gas emissions, if you take all the other noxious things that come out of big ships, the sulfides and the oxides and the nitrides and these things, the 50 largest ships in the world do as much polluting damage than the entire fleet of cars in the world. So they will be regulated, and that is coming. Swire have spotted that, so Swire have gone ahead and said, if we're going to be regulated, if we're going to have to offset in the future, we need to have credits. And they've gone ahead and already acquired a large chunk of land to do that, and we've been working with them. That is a company that gets this, gets the business of what we're talking about here. Uh, and I think that's really, really fascinating. On sustainability generally, we say that sustainability from a business perspective must be economically rational. It must be something that makes <coughs> business sense. I'm going to talk a few, give you a few examples of that, um, but just before I do that, how many of you have heard of an organization called TEEB? T-E-E-B. One. <laughs> Two, three, four, five. Oh, it's getting better. Not many. TEEB is a very unwieldy acronym for something called the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. It was sponsored by the UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme, run by a, a banker um, from Deutsche Bank called Pavan Sukhdev, a very, very bright man, who said, we need to value this stuff. We need to value the ecosystem services that nature provides to humankind. We were really taken by this, and particularly the, the report he calls his D3 report, which is the report for business. And so we actually wrote that report with him, which values, puts a, a value for business on ecosystem services. It's the first time it's been done, um, and others have picked it up, and I'll talk about a couple of projects that actually picked that up. But to Sir David's point about the people on the ground, the indigenous people who live on the land, um, they're the ones who should be the custodians, absolutely rightly, of preserving that land. Sometimes they themselves don't know the value of the ecosystem service within which they live. And part of our job is to do that sort of work, actually showing the value of the ecosystem service to them and finding different business models that allow them to capture that value so that they can continue to live there without having to degrade the land themselves, which is sometimes the problem. TEEB is, as I said, something which most of you haven't heard of. Its biggest problem is its name. It should have been called TEN, as I keep on calling, telling Pavan. It should have been called TEN, which is the economics of nature, where you go, oh, I can understand that a bit better. I understand what we're talking about here. Um, ecosystem services broadly provide humankind with four types of service. Provisioning services, that's the food, the fibre, the timber, the wood, things that grow. They provide regulating services, more than you'd ever believe, particularly around water. They store water, they purify water, they regulate water, they prevent flood damage. Eco so ecosystem services provide these regulating services. They provide supporting services, so they build the soil. The ecosystem services make the soil uh, that then allow us uh, to actually plant the food, to grow the food. In places like China, it takes about a million years to create something like an inch of soil. Um, we plough it and lose it in one dust storm. We have to work out what the value is that has been created that we cannot simply replace. And the fourth is cultural. As Sir David said, we wouldn't have his sanity without the lovely ecosystem services, without the biodiversity we have. Um, so those are the four, the four provisioning services we talk about, and you can value them. And there's sort of all sorts of estimates about what goes on. Let's put this into context. Broadly speaking, the calculations show that the ecosystem services that we rely on, if we had to pay for them, would cost about $50 trillion a year of those four services. $50 trillion a year. Put that into context, global GDP is about $60 trillion a year. <coughs> so ecosystem services provide almost as much as we as humankind create ourselves. The cost to preserve all those services and stop degrading them, a mere $93 billion. 
less than 1%, is all that would need to be taken to preserve all the ecosystem services we currently degrade. And yet it simply doesn't happen. So these are big numbers, but they're important numbers. Let me give you three examples, three simple examples, of what we do when we talk about ecosystem services. I'll start with the Catskill Mountains. <coughs> How many, anybody know where the Catskill Mountains are? A few nods, yeah, a bit more than the Teeb, good. Mm -hmm. Catskill Mountains are just north of New York in New York State. The Catskill Mountain watershed provides about a third of New York's potable water for New York City. A few years ago, uh, the New York authorities noticed that the quality of the water they were getting from this watershed was dropping. Dropping to the point where they were going to have to spend $10 billion on new kit, new purification and filtration kit to clean the water to get it back to potable. Why was it going down in quality? Three reasons. Farming, more nitrates, more phosphates from fertilizer. Leisure activities, there was more leisure activity going on in the mountains, putting pollutants into the watershed. And finally, forestry. Um, as I said, forests are a massive water regulator. Uh, they store water, they clean water, they stop soil erosion. Those three things were reducing the quality of the water coming out of the Catskill Mountain watershed to the point where New York City was going to have to find $10 billion to keep that water clean for their people. They were able to secure the license over that entire watershed, buy the license to own and operate that entire Catskill Mountain watershed for $2.7 billion. A quarter of the price to secure it and then to manage it in a way that didn't stop the farming, but got the farming going on a more environmentally friendly basis, didn't stop the leisure activities or didn't stop the forestry. But all those things were done in a different way and the water quality has gone back up. A simple example of an ecosystem service, once you can value it, you can actually work out different ways of managing it. The second is slightly different. Uh, Puma Leisure Wear, or the sports lifestyle company. Puma, uh, their chief exec is very, very strong on this stuff. Um, he saw the work done by TEEP. He saw how we were looking to value ecosystem services. And he said, I want Puma to be the first company to produce an environmental p and account. That is an a p and account that actually places a value, a cost, on all the ecosystems that we have used as if we had paid for them. Not the carbon price on a, on a, on a traded market, because of course that's in the floor at the moment, but the actual value to society um, of all those externalities that we rely on. He did it through their entire supply chain, right the way down to what we call tier four, which is where does the raw material come from that we use. And to his utter amazement, over 80% of the value, of the cost of their externalities was in their raw materials, in their cotton and in their leather. And the one which was the worst was leather, and it was because the externality that they were having the most effect on, to, to David's point entirely, was change of land use. Because leather comes from cattle, and you destroy valuable ecosystem services to create cattle. And you can value all those things. It's highly technical. I don't, I'm not going to bore you with how you do it. I'm not going to bore you with how you, how you spread the value of, the, of the, the, the meat from the cow versus the leather from the cow. All that stuff is all technical stuff. But what they discovered was the single biggest impact that Puma was having on the environment was change of land use. Now they can do something about it. Because they know. So, and they are, by the way. The second was cotton. Uh, and cotton, of course, was water use water comes when they were they, where their cotton comes from comes from quite areas where water is quite scarce so it has a very high social cost so that, that that's puma and that's a corporate who is absolutely looking to work out their effect on the environment and how they can do something about it uh, the third is closer to forestry and it's to do with the panama canal the perceived wisdom in the panama canal is that you should strip the banks of the panama canal keep them clear to stop debris falling into the canal. As a result, when it rains, the soils on the side of the canal go into the canal and they're having to dredge it every several years to clear the soil the silt back out. They have just worked out that actually reforestation of the banks of the Panama Canal to hold the soil to stop the need for dredging is a significantly cheaper option than clearing it and then dredging it. So they are reforesting in a very biodiverse positive way, by the way, the banks of the Panama Canal right now, funded by, entirely funded by the private sector, because it's economically rational to do it. And by the way, they also should get carbon credits, because reforestation will attract carbon credits, 
as and when there's a trading scheme. But that is bunts on top. It's economically rational without the carbon credits. So what we encourage our clients to do is think about ecosystem services like any other piece of plant and machinery. They provide services that you wouldn't believe they provided, that you get for free, that you don't value. You absolutely can value them, and very often you find that you can find a cheaper alternative using ecosystem services or preserving ecosystem services uh, than you can by trying to build the kit and run it yourselves. That's really what I wanted to say. Um, we're very proud to be supporting the World Land Trust, and we continue to do so. Um, we're very, very proud with all the work we're doing in this area to bring it to the attention of corporates, to bring it into the boardroom, because that's where we really will make a difference, in my view. Uh, and just on a final, final comment, uh, our job is not to help people see the wood for the trees. It's to help them see all the value in all the wood, in all the trees. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Well, I'm prepared to do quite a lot for the World Land Trust, but there are limits, and I thought I'd reach one of them tonight when I was asked to come and speak here, because the brief was fairly intimidating, another person having to follow David Attenborough. So here comes one of the great anticlimaxes of your life. A comic following Morecambe and Wise, a guitarist following Jimi Hendrix, a runner trying to catch up with Usain Bolt. But then I had a little think about this, and because as you see, I am here. And I worked up that for the last half a century and more, what I have actually been doing is following David Attenborough. <laughs> so it would be somewhat inconsistent of me to stop now. <laughs> when I was at Sunny Hill uh, Junior School in Streatham, my prize, selected by myself, was David Attenborough's Zoo Quest for a Dragon. His television programs lit up my childhood. I remember in particular his Zoo Quest to Madagascar, in which he laid great stress on his attempts to be the first person to bring home film of an elusive and peculiar lemur called the Indri, the great nocturnal singer of the Malagasy forest. And it was from this program I had my first intimations of the fragility of the planet we live on. Now, I've always had a great love for the wild, and it's something I was born with, but then I think we all are. When David showed me that when I was a child, such a love was not a childish thing, not something that you can set aside when more grown-up things like football and pop music come along. <laughs> David showed me that a passion for the wild world was something that could and should be taken into grown-up life. David, David legitimized this early love his subsequent programs sent shafts of light through the confusing period of adolescence. <laughs> I remember in particular David's celebration of a cave system in Borneo. It was an ecosystem that was based on the immemorial droppings of bats and cave swiftlets. It was the biggest heap of shit in the entire <laughs> of the known world. It was teeming with life. And I was in absolutely enthralled by the multiform, multifarious multitude that David showed me once again. Now, apologies if that frank four-letter word offended anybody, but um, if so, uh, brace yourselves, because there's going to be another one coming along in a minute. <laughs> now, I went away and ran away to Asia, rather than getting a grown-up job, and uh, was found myself living on an outlying island near Hong Kong. And while I was there, one of the great old Hong Kong companies, I forget which at this juncture, let's say it was the Honkers and Shankers. Anyway, they did a um, reckless and courageous thing, and they agreed to sponsor a television program and to run it all the way through without interruption, without any advertisements, let the thing stand for itself. And the program they chose for this was perhaps the greatest masterpiece that television has ever shown us. It was, of course, David Attenborough's natural history, life on Earth. <laughs> we didn't have many televisions available to us on the island, so we would gather around in a gang every time it was shown. And once again, I found myself enthralled. <laughs> and my great love from childhood, my great love from adolescence, became the great love of my adult life. And I've never again been tempted to stray. 
These days I'm chief sports writer of the Times, and you have to admit that that as day jobs go, that's quite a lot to be said for it. <laughs> if all goes well, this year I will be covering my seventh Summer Olympic Games, and I'm looking forward to it hugely. But I also write two weekly wildlife columns for the Times. I love writing about sport. It's the greatest way I know of writing about humanity for a newspaper. But it's not enough. It's not enough because sport is not enough. It's not enough because humanity is not enough. Now, there are three ways in which humanity uh, uh, has for trying to save non-human life and the wild places where you find it. The first two I'll go through kind of quickly. David has already uh, touched on them. The first is it's our stern, solemn, moral duty to do so as stewards of this planet and all that kind of stuff. The number two is the fact that we should look after our planet because it's in our own best interest to do so. We are doing a lot of strange and unprecedented things to the planet, and we are losing species at a fairly great rate. So what's going to happen next? Well, this is the rivet popper hypothesis. Here's an aeroplane flying through the sky. It loses a rivet. So what? It flies on. Another. Same story. And another, and another, and another, and another, and another. There is going to come a point when this aeroplane falls out of the sky. So what is going to happen to a planet-wide ecosystem that is losing species after species after species after species? I don't know. Nobody does. But it does look as if we might be on the verge of finding out. One planet, one experiment. But it is the third reason for conserving the planet that really matters. And it's the one that was taught to me by David Attenborough across the years. And it's something I've experienced myself in my subsequent travels all over the place, perhaps most especially when I've been doing so for the World Land Trust. So here comes that frank four-letter word I was promising you earlier <laughs> on. Sorry it offends. It's not much used in uh, polite society, at least not sincerely. It's the only one that will do. Love. Well, love, of course, love, obviously love. What else but love? <laughs> the best reason for conserving the planet and its wildlife is because we really, really want to. Because we understand about saving the world with our minds, yes, but also with our hearts and with our essential guts. That wrenching, marrow-deep, soul-deep love is something I've felt when walking among lions, when watching the tail flukes of a humpback whale from an open boat just a cricket pitch away, from the extraordinary proximity of bears, from the flight of a lammer guy, from the sudden flash of revelation of the blue morpho butterfly. We need the wild world. It's not an add-on, a bonus, a nice little addition for those who can afford it. It's something we need. It's something we all seek in our different ways. The most popular leisure activity. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I, I, I can read my notes. Very good. Okay, here we go. Most popular leisure activity in Britain is going for a nice walk in the country. Um, we take holidays by the sea, we play golf, we go fishing, we do gardening, we buy homes in the leafy suburb. If we can afford it, we get a second home out in the countryside. We have dogs and we walk them, we have horses and we ride them. We uh, uh, we recover better from surgical operations if we have a window, better still if we can see trees from that window. And if we get uh, reappointed to the New York office, what we would like, please, is a nice apartment overlooking Central Park. <laughs> These are all ways in which we grope for the things that David Attenborough has shown us. I've visited World Land Trust projects across the world. I've made the transition from the brutally farmed landscapes of Belize into the frightening, uncomfortable, and altogether wonderful rainforest first night I was there, I thought it was John Burton, the CEO of the World Land Trust, snoring in the hut that we were sharing. In fact, it was the extraordinary din made by the altogether extraordinary uh, howler monkey. I've seen the spider monkeys making their bizarre five-limb passage across the canopy. And perhaps best of all, I've seen a jaguar glowing as if lit from within, striding down a forest path with the neck on him like my Tyson. <laughs> in Brazil, I've ridden a horse, a bony little thing built like a whippet, able to go on forever, up, up into the hills to the most remote and inaccessible parts of the Atlantic rainforest. And then I've come back down again into 
a rainforest restoration project, one that was genuinely succeeding in putting the toothpaste back into the tube. In <laughs> Paraguay, I've driven for miles across the uncompromising dry Chaco, and there I went through a blizzard of white butterflies, one that didn't let up for an instant as we drove through it for hour after hour. I visited elephant corridors in India and watched the elephants reclaiming their own, and also seen in the grass, burning bright, a tiger, burning as only a tiger can. And they're currently working on a, uh, setting up a project in Zambia in partnership with an emerald mine. But were they as ethical as they claimed? After all, we're not here to do greenwash. So we went out to inspect, and as a merest bonus, there's 40 square kilometers of forest above the mine. Ach, Mendes, absolutely no game out here. Well, five minutes after that, Burton and I found footprints of Dyker, Genet, and Mongoose. Subsequently, a team from Eust University of East Anglia has been out there, and they found 210 species of birds. And now this excellent piece of forest is to be managed for, for wildlife. All these spirit experiences are available to us all. The World Land Trust is very keen that its supporters experience such things. It's all very well trying to galvanize people with talk of self-interest <coughs> and duty, but we know that what lasts and what matters is love. And the best way to learn and to deepen that love is to be out there among the lions and the tigers and the elephants and the jaguars and the butterflies and all the other endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful. In other words, what we need to do as individuals, as a community, and as a species, is to follow Atom. To understand that our lives are not complete with just our own species. To understand that we all need to be a little wilder than we are. That without the wild places and the wild creatures that live there, we are all that little bit less than a human. David Attenborough showed us the way, and it's the way of love. And the World Trust just happens to be the finest way in which we can all follow David Attenborough. <laughs> Thank you very much. person chasing Hussein Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> very, very difficult task. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rohini Finch, and I have the very great honor of being chairman of the Bolt Land Trust. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here today. Um, it's so wonderful and encouraging for us and the work that we do. It's so wonderful to see so many people who are business leaders, who are influential in their fields, and who've come here to learn how to make a difference, to attempt to make a difference, just as we do each and every single day. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed the evening. We hope that you've been inspired. We hope that you've been inspired to get to know us, to get to know our work. Um, it's always the first step that's the hardest. Um, but we, we, we thank you for being here with us, uh, with us today. I'd um, just like to take a few minutes to say thank you. Um, first of all, to our host, Charles Russell, uh, this evening, not just for hosting this evening and uh, introducing us to yourselves, um, but also for their kind donation we should be using it to uh, purchase land and protect habitat. Um, I'd especially like to say thank you to Edward Craig, who has led our relationship with Charles Russell and uh, who's been instrumental in organizing uh, this evening um, for us. I'd like to say thank you to Michael Preston of PwC. Um, PwC are well, one of our earliest <coughs> supporters, and it's uh, so nice to hear his first-hand experience of uh, what corporate support can do and the opportunities that it can pretend, uh, provide, uh, not only for, cha for charitable work, but for the businesses as well. Thank you for the wonderful Simon Barnes for 
not only sharing his uh, stories of his adventures with the World Land Trust, uh, but also imparting his passion to us. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, Sir David Attenborough. Um, I speak on behalf of the whole room, I'm sure. Um, it's been a privilege to have you here with us this evening. Um, the World Land Trust are very grateful for all the support and encouragement that you give us. Um, we are deeply honored to be able to say that you are our patron, our supporter, and our friend for so many years. say thank you to all of you for being here with us this evening. Um, as Patrick Russell said at the beginning of the evening, there are pledges at either ends of the room. Please do give as generously as you feel you are able. But also, please, John and Viv Burton, the founders are here, uh, as are a lot of the World Land Trust team. Please get to know us. Please feel free to discuss whatever forms of support that you are able to offer us. Enjoy your evening. Thank you again.